have no right to be ordinary. God has called you to be extraordinary. Good morning, Liberty University. Let's stand up on our feet today. We worship the Rock of Ages, who is unfailing and unwavering. So if you believe that today, let's sing it together. You're faithful. I count on one thing. The same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out, yeah. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy.
Thank you, Worship Collective. Aren't they great leading us in worship? Thank you. You all may be seated. And we had a great time of worship today. And I just want to remind you about liberty in prayer. And we need to be praying for all these requests as you see them here. Last week they were so deep you couldn't, the box was you couldn't hardly see them. And we're going to be placing these throughout the, the campus and uh, you're going to be able, they'll have a top on them actually, so that, and you'll be able to slide the card through the slot. And that way it'll keep somebody else maybe reading your prayer requests that maybe you don't want them to know about. So it'll be private. But I want to encourage you to stop by and pray for these requests. Also, you know, we're encouraging you to pray the Lord's Prayer. I hope you've downloaded Dr. Towns' uh, book on praying the Lord's Prayer for spiritual breakthrough. Now, let me tell you, when we talk about praying the Lord's Prayer, we're not talking about our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We're not talking about that. We're talking about you praying it in a meaningful way as Dr. Towns tells us and explains to us in the book how it can make you and help you feel like you're walking with the Lord every day, every moment. And I wish I had had the opportunity to read his book years ago, but I did not come across it until 10 or 15 years ago. And I want to tell you, it just made my relationship and feeling like I'm close to the Lord more than anything else. So I hope you'll download it. They'll put it up uh, sometime uh, today. Maybe they already have, and, uh, and you'll do that. This morning, I took a picture. I want you to put it up, the picture Let's see, where is it? Uh, here's the text. This. I took this picture this morning. Here was a student. I don't know who it is. And they were at the graveside of our founder, Dr. Falwell. And there's the cross as you see it, as you see there. And they were praying. This individual was there for about five minutes. I didn't. My wife said, come over here and look at this. And I, I looked and I took this picture. And, you know, I believe we have a student body that believes in prayer. And as you see these boxes throughout the campus, we're going to try to put them in a different place every time. I hope you'll stop just like this student stopped at the cross at the gravesite of our founder and pray for these requests. There's a lot of serious requests here in this box. I want to pray for them right now, lest you and I bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a God that hears and answers prayer. We thank you that you're a God that can do anything. And Lord, some of these requests here in this prayer box, Lord, their requests for a miracle to take place in their life or the life of somebody else. Lord, the miracle may be of healing, maybe the miracle of forgiveness of sin. Lord, we just pray that you will Answer these requests, help these people, help our students. And Lord, for those that are watching today, Lord, we heard from many that are watching this convo. And they wanted to know if they could send in their request. And Lord, we pray for those requests that they've sent in already. Thank you, Lord, for being such a gracious, loving God. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for what you did on the cross. And Lord, we thank you that for whosoever shall call upon your name can be saved and go to heaven and spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, somebody touched me and I didn't realize it was this. I got scared a little bit. You know, we're glad that Pastor Jonathan is our campus pastor and I'm privileged to introduce to him right now. Let's give him a big round of applause as he comes to introduce our speaker.
You know, honestly, I'm really grateful that we have a president, an academic leader in our institution that actually cares about the power of prayer, don't you? I remember back when I was a child and my dad would often say, all the way up until the, literally days before he passed away, he would make this statement, nothing of eternal significance is ever accomplished apart from prayer. And so when we recognize that God has called all of us to do great things in our lives, to impact this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it starts from, it flows from our personal prayer life. I'm just so grateful that uh, we have a leadership team here that is focused on helping all of us to understand and to double down, if you will, on our connection to and our dependence on prayer. And so I encourage you, uh, make sure like that is something that is a part of your everyday journey. Now, this morning, we've got a great, great speaker that is here with us. We've been here once before. And she's spoken at conferences literally all over the world. She is someone who is a best-selling author. She's written uh, books that have gone out now over 3 million in print in 25 different languages. Uh, she, a lot of the research that she does appears on t- the Today Show and New York Times and lots of other different uh, magazines and uh, television programs. Uh, today, she's going to come and to share with us uh, some important truths that God God has revealed to her on what it means to live out this thing called our faith in the lives that we live. And so I just want you to join with me in welcoming back to the Liberty Stage, Shanti Feldhahn. Thank you, Pastor. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be back with you guys. And I have to tell you, I am, what I do I'm a social researcher, as Pastor Jonathan just said, and one of the things that that has done is that, I know this is gonna sound funny, but it's given me like the best opening line when I meet people at parties, because I'm probably most well known for these books. Uh, The book For Women Only, the subtitle is What You Need to Know About the Inner Lives of Men. Okay. And for men only is a straightforward guide to the inner lives of women. Yeah. And so when I meet like random strangers, like literally this just happened when I was checking into the hotel yesterday. When I meet random strangers, you know how you have that and as you guys get out into the workforce, you'll see this. You have that kind of awkward conversation, which is, what do you do? What do you do, right? And usually it's a guy asking me that question, and he says, so, what do you do? And I say, I help women understand men. (laughs) And it's hilarious, the reactions that I get. Because half the time, the guy is like, what are you going to tell him about us? (laughs) There's this concern on their faces. And half the time, the reaction is this. (laughs) We're really not that complicated. Okay, ladies, how many of you, I'm going to ask the women in the room, how many of you have heard a guy say that? We're really not that complicated. Right. Okay, guess what? It's not true. It turns out, it turns out there is so much more depth and complexity and vulnerability going on inside the men around us than we realize. Now, guys, I have a question for you. How many of you guys have ever said, girls are just way too complicated to understand? (laughs) All right, guess what? That's not true either. It turns out that both of us, both the guys, both the girls, all of us have grown up with these ideas 
about how guys are wired, how girls are wired, who's simple, who's complicated, whatever those things are. I don't know where these ideas come from, like maybe middle school, I don't know. But we grow up with these assumptions about how somebody thinks. And on top of those assumptions, we've built habits. And I'm here to tell you that based on 17 years of research with over 35,000 men and women over these last 17 years, I'm here to tell you that some of our assumptions are wrong. And not just like a little wrong, but like a lot wrong. Now, not everything, of course, but there's some very, very key ones. And so it gets in the way of our relationship every day without us realizing it. It gets in the way of our friendships. It gets in the way of a relationship with like a brother or sister, or mother or father. And it certainly gets in the way without us ever intending to with dating relationships and eventually marriage. I have one job here. And that is to bring you some information that you may not realize that you don't know that you don't know in order to save your marriages in advance. That is my one job today. Now, that is a big statement, and it's not me that's gonna do this. So let me ask you guys a question. This is a very serious question, right? I'm not just saying this because we're in sort of a Christian environment. If it's true, if it's true that we have some ideas about the other person, some assumptions, we've built some habits that are just kind of wrong. Are you willing today to give God permission to open your eyes to those things? And are you willing today to give God permission to change your mind? If there's any, any areas that need to be changed, are you willing to do that today? Are you willing to do that today? Okay. I am going to stop and pray. Seriously, we are going to stop and pray. If you agree with me, if you, this is between you and the Lord, right? Do this business with the Lord just really briefly and give him permission. Lord, I am so grateful that when you walked this earth, you were so good at opening blind eyes. Lord, if there's any ways that we're blind, open our eyes. I give you permission, change my mind if there's any areas that need to be changed. And Lord, we are so grateful to be your children. We trust you with this in Jesus' name. God will take you up on that, by the way. Okay, now I'm going to be moving really fast because I want to download to you some of what we've learned. Now, just briefly, this is all based on these 17 years of research that I mentioned, right? We've spent more than $850,000 in order to do 12 nationally representative surveys over the years, studies, in order to bring what we think, we hope, and statistically works out to be the little things that make the biggest difference once we kind of realize them. And so I'm going to share three things because we don't have a whole lot of time. I'm going to give you sort of a big picture overview of something we need to get down deep. And then I'm going to take a couple minutes and take a minute to help women understand some things about men and men understand some things about women. Okay? So that's going to be our, our agenda. The first thing, the big picture thing, I know this is a shocker to everybody in the room, but men and women are just kind of different in some ways. <laughs> I know that's a shocker. But here is specifically, specifically the difference that tends to get in the way and to put obstacles in our path that we don't want to be there. It turns out that statistically, men and women tend, and I should, let me, I should have said this at the beginning, I'm going to be making some generalizations, right? That by definition, we have to make some generalizations. But it's really important for me to say this. There are 
always exceptions, right? If 75% of women said one way, by definition, 25% didn't, right? Everybody is an individual, and the key is use this as a starting point. Allow God to open your eyes to these things and to be able to see, does this particular thing apply to this person because I didn't realize it before? Okay, so big picture, the one thing that we have seen underneath so many heartaches, so much tension in relationships, eventually in marriage, is that men and women tend, not always, but tend to have two different sets of primary insecurities running under the surface. And because of that, those insecurities that tend to be a bit different, what that means by definition is that if you're in a relationship, something different is going to hurt your boyfriend or girlfriend's feelings than would hurt yours. Something different is going to hurt your spouse's feelings than would hurt yours. And now, to some degree, we're all kind of insecure about a lot of things, and we all need a lot of things, but I'm talking about the heartbeat stuff that statistically tends to get most in the way. Let me give you an example of how this played out one time in a focus group that I was doing. So most of our research is based on these big nationally representative surveys that are uh, done pretty rigorously across age and racial background and religious background and demographics, all sorts of geography. But we also do a lot of focus groups just to hear people talk and think and process out loud. And so I was doing focus groups, two focus groups. One was with a group of college-age young men. The next night was a group of college-age young women. We were in one of those conference rooms. You know those, um, you know those conference rooms where you have the big table and then the whiteboards on the walls with the doors that close? You know what I'm talking about? So we were in there, and I opened up this whiteboard the first night with the guys, and I said, you know, I want to do something a little bit different tonight. I want to chart on this whiteboard, what are the things for you as a guy that when someone says this or does this, that it feels kind of bad? Like, it kind of hurts your feelings. Not that any 20-year-old guy is going to say, it hurts my feelings, but you know, you know what I mean. Like, what are those things? And then, what is it that feels great? When someone says this or does this, it lights you up. We spent all evening on it. We got it just right. They told me what to write. And at the end of the night, I realized I was running out of time, didn't have time to erase this whole thing, and the girls were going to be in there in the next night. So I just closed those doors. The next night, I'm in there with the girls, and I open up the whiteboard on this wall. And I said the same thing. Let's chart your feet, your sort of your fears, your needs as girls. And this one young woman raised her hand and interrupted me. And she said, um, excuse me, but I really object to this language. Okay. And she said, look, it's not our fears and our needs as girls. I mean, we're all just people, right? We have the same fears, we have the same needs as people. And I said, okay, that's totally fine. Let's chart your fears as people. And so we spent all evening on it. They told me what to write. We erased and wrote and they got it all just right. And then I purposely left five minutes at the end. You knew what I was gonna do, right? (laughs) And at the end, I asked these girls, I'm like, so um, the guys were in here last night. Does anybody wanna see what they said. And so I opened up this whiteboard and I stood back and I watched their faces. And the girls were like, and their heads are swiveling back and forth. Their jaws were really truly dropping open because there was not one word the same. Not one except for, you know, and, (laughs) the, right? Not one. So what was on the board? It turns out that underneath, in our sort of deepest places, the question in a girl's heart, in a woman's heart, is basically, am I lovable? Am I special? Am I beautiful? Am I worthy of being loved for who I am on the inside? So there's a deep need that comes with that 
in, to feel loved and cherished and adored. That's kind of like what the whole thing that we think is the whole point of having the relationship, right? Like if you're not going to feel loved, what's the point? And it's, a, and, and it's a big surprise to find out that when you look, when we looked at the men's whiteboards, the question wasn't, am I lovable? The question was, am I able? Am I adequate? Do I measure up? Am I any good at what I do on the outside? Think about the difference here. Am I worthy of being loved for who I am on the inside? Am I any good at what I do on the outside? Totally different. And it lends itself to a totally different set of primary needs. Now. Again, to some degree, we're all kind of insecure about everything, and we all need everything, right? But this, like I said, this is the stuff that if we don't get it, it does tend to get in the way of the relationship that we're hoping for. So let's take a minute and turn to helping the women understand the men really briefly, and then we'll switch it. Because what are the new, somebody over there is very excited about this, all right. So, what is it that we most need to understand for us as women? Now, remember, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. You don't have to do a thing with what I'm saying. But here's what I would urge you. If you're a little skeptical, don't believe me. Try it and see what happens. So, here's kind of the big picture. For us as women... Like I said, we most want to feel loved and cherished and adored. That's kind of what we think is the whole point of having the relationship. It's a big surprise to find out that for men, that's not the point at all. And that for most of the men on my survey, it was 74% of the men said, I would give up if I had to. Not that anybody would want to have to make this choice. But if I had to, I will give up feeling that my wife or my girlfriend loves me, if I can just feel that she appreciates me, that she believes in me, that she respects me, that she trusts me, and that she admires me. And those five things were far more important to the average guy even than feeling that his wife or his girlfriend loved him. Ladies, that is a big deal difference between men and women, and it gets us as, to, in, as women into so much trouble because we women, we're really good at showing love. Like, how ironic is that? Like, we just naturally, to some degree, if I were to ask for a show of hands, it would probably be about 75, 80%. We say it comes naturally to say, honey, I love you, to do things we hope he'll find to be loving. And at the same time, without realizing it, we may be criticizing him a lot. Or may, we may be teasing him in front of his friends. <laughs> Somebody's like, no. Or we may be teasing him in front of his friends. Like he says, you know what, I probably should get going. I need to think about going to the gym. And you say, <laughs> you always say you're going to go to the gym and then you game instead. Now, we have no intention of doing this, but what we have just done when we say some little comment that we think is so funny, or we tell him what to do a lot. Oh no, thanks for um, helping to, to paint my, my room, but you know, it doesn't go that way, it goes this way. Like, we don't realize that when we do that, what we are saying is, no, you're not able. No, you're not adequate. And oh, by the way, this thing that you're doing on the outside, it isn't good enough. We have no idea that that is a painful message. We have to understand what it is that is sending those painful messages so we can avoid them. And it is any little thing that says, I think you or what you just did is inadequate. That's it. And we think, you're so oversensitive, dude. <laughs> that should not bother you. 
And we don't realize that we're saying that because it wouldn't bother us. He's not us. He's wired very differently by a God who knew what he was doing. So we have to understand what sends that negative message and avoid it. So again, any little day-to-day minor thing that says, I think you're inadequate. We also have to understand how to send the positive message instead. What is it that builds a guy up? What is it that is his equivalent of, I love you? Because, you know, I love you to a guy, for us, that's a big deal. For to a guy, it's just, it's nice. It doesn't hit them at an emotional level in exactly the same way. What is it that does that hits them in that emotional way? Believe it or not, it took us about six years of studies and we finally found it. Ladies, it is two words. Believe it or not, it is thank you. Believe it or not, when you tell, (laughs) the guys are like, huh. When you say, thank you so much for helping me paint that room, and you leave out, oh, but you missed a spot. Because he knows he's missed a spot. They're very attuned to that. When you say, thank you so much for standing up for me in class, that is life to a guy. I was talking to a young woman um, who was another one who said, I'm not sure I believe you. I said, don't believe me, just try it. She went off, she was about 22, 23 years old. She went off to her waitressing job that night. She had had her eye on one of the guys who was another server at this restaurant. His name was Kyle. She thought he was kind of cute. Kyle, sorry, I know we have Kyles in here. And Kyle and the manager of the restaurant had been having a personality conflict and it had been pretty miserable for everybody working there. That night, she watched across the room as the manager came over to Kyle and started trying to get into it again with him. And Kyle said, she watched across the room as Kyle said, you know what, we can't do this. It's making it miserable for everybody. Let's take this offline, call me later, okay? And he walked away. This young woman walked up to him and said, you know, um, Kyle, I, I saw what you did. He was trying to provoke you. And you wouldn't let him because you knew how miserable that this had been for all of us. Thank you for doing that. You are such a man of honor. Thank you. And she walked away. She said later, Shanti, he followed me around all night. (laughs) Because here was a woman who saw what he did and said it was good. And that is what every guy is longing for. Okay, I wish we could keep going on this topic, but we need to switch it, because all the girls are like, come on. Yeah, all right. So we need to switch it to understanding, helping the guys understand the girls. Are you guys ready? Okay, all right. I only have a couple minutes here. So, when, when we are in a dating relationship or eventually a marriage relationship, every guy in this room knows that women want to feel loved. That is not a surprise. What is a surprise is how easy it is for her to not feel loved. What is a surprise is to find out that, oh my goodness, where my question is, do I measure up? This amazing girl, this amazing woman has a question, am I lovable? And here's the big surprise, guys. When you eventually move through a dating relationship and you eventually find this amazing woman and you get married to her and you watch her walk down the aisle and you pledge your love and fidelity to each other, for you, the 
the deal is sealed. You're kind of like, okay, on to the next thing, right? Like it's done. It never rises up in your mind again, does she love me? That question, unless there's really significant issue in the relationship, for most, again, not all men, but for most, that question just doesn't come up. Here's what you need to know. In a woman's brain, because of our underground question, our underground insecurity, that question, am I lovable, that doesn't go away. It just morphs to, does he really love me? Is he glad he married me? Are we okay? There is no switch in a woman's brain once she says that I do and signs the papers. There is no switch in a woman's brain that gets flipped to the, oh, now I feel permanently loved position. And instead, she has that question every day. Am I lovable? Am I special to him? She has that question every day. And here's the big aha for so many guys. She's looking for signals as to the answer to that question every day. Just like, you don't think about it this way, but just like you are looking for signals about the answer to the do I measure up, am I any good at what I do question every day. Now obviously we most need to get that sense of reassurance from the Lord, but God has put us into each other's lives for a purpose. And guys, you have a powerful position to be able to reassure your friend, your girlfriend, eventually your wife, in some really, really important ways. Let me mention something about um, this that's a big picture thing, just really briefly. Some guys, many as a matter of fact, need to rewind what they think a girl finds appealing to begin with. When, <laughs> when, when we were doing one of our surveys with uh, uh, men and women, young men, young women, up to the age of 21, when we were doing our surveys, we asked, we gave the, the young women a list of attractive qualities. And we said, you know, what is it that you find most appealing in a guy? And, you know, there was about 12 different categories and it was everything from he's athletic, he's rich, he's got a great body, whatever it is, okay? So we gave them a list of these categories and asked them to rate them. When we ask the guys, what is it that you think women find most attractive, the guys look at the list and they say one, two, and three are buff body, athletic, and rich. That's the list the guys think are the top three. Guys, guess which was the bottom three? Buff body, athletic, and rich. Now, the top three the top three, and I'm running out of time, so if you want to know this. <laughs> <laughs> the top three were sense of humor. <laughs> thoughtfulness. <laughs> and self-confidence. Now guys, guys, here's the thing. You don't need to be born with those. Those are things you can develop. Now, what this means, what this means is something really, really powerful. Because what this means is that the and we found this statistically, this amazing young woman that you're interested in, 
She would far rather have you as sort of a average nice guy than the arrogant jerk who looks like a model. Now, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the uh, organizers if I can have another minute because I really have to explain this. Here's the reality. Every guy in this room just crossed his arms and thought to himself, oh yeah, she says she wants the nice guy, so why does she always go for the bad boy? Okay. Here is why. Here is why. And if you can grasp this, guys, you will set yourself up well to be an amazing husband for the rest of your life. Okay, here is the reason why. That cocky bad boy is much more likely to approach her in a way that makes her feel special. He is much more likely to pursue he is much more likely to come up to her in the hallway and go, hey, beautiful. <laughs> Listen, I'm not suggesting that the, every guy does that, but guys, do not misunderstand this. She would far rather you come up to her and tell her, you know, I've really enjoyed hanging out with you. I'd really love to go get pizza. I'd really love to do this. I'd really love to do that. Rather than, rather than her feeling like she's the one that has to do that. Because it says, it says one thing. You may feel that you wonder whether you're special, I think you're special. That message will set you up well. Listen, I'm out of time, but let me just... <laughs> Listen, I, I promise, I'm so sorry, but I know you guys have to get to class, but... <laughs> Let me encourage you with this one final point, okay? The bigger picture point here is that we have all been given a lot of power in each other's lives to build one another up in these areas that we're insecure about or without realizing it to tear one another down. And that brings up the image of old bunk Uncle Ben telling Peter Parker, Spider-Man, or Aunt May telling Spider-Man, you've been given great power and with great power comes Thank you guys. Aren't you all so grateful for that truth that she shared with us this morning? <laughs> Just thank Shanti for a sec. We're so grateful for her and the bombs of wisdom that she dropped. I just want to take a second and refocus and remind ourselves that in light of this truth that we heard, know that Jesus Christ has to be the center of all of our relationships, all of our lives. He has to be the center of this campus and the church body. And so we're gonna sing this next song as a prayer and declaration that we're inviting Christ to be back in the middle where he belongs. And so let's stand united and sing this song together. Let's go. 
Jesus at the center of it all. Come on, every voice. And Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning. From beginning. Yeah. It's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning. this morning and Jesus be the center of my life and Jesus be the center of my life and from beginning to the end it will always be it's always been
Joy Shanti felt hot today. Well, you know, obviously, you know, I think probably many of you in this room would stay here for like two hours listening to what she had to say. And so when she walked off stage, she has a couple of books here that she had with her. And one says for women only, and one says for men only. And so this is a picture of like everything she talked about in a lot more detail. And so, you know, we've done this a few times, so I asked her if she would sign a couple of these. And so I'm wondering, like, what part of the room have we not given books to this? Okay, so I need one guy and one girl. Uh, let's see. Which, come here, come here, here we go, here we go. So, have you signed this one? What's your name? Eric Young. A-A-R-O-N? E-R-I-C. Oh, Eric, okay. Okay, while she's doing that, now we need a, a female. Oh, right here, right there. Yeah, in, in the stripe, in the stripe. Yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> Come on over here. Sign, so, what's your name? What's your name? Monique. What is it? Monique. Monique. How do you spell it? M-O-N-I-T-U-E. All right. So while she's doing that, I want to remind you tonight, campus community, is going to be here at 7 o'clock. The collective will be here. Charles Billingsley is preaching tonight, so make sure you come back out and be a part of the night. God bless you, and have a great day.